That's a cute little bus, though. I was like, I wonder if I could get a bus like that and drive around and pick up kids. <laughs> okay, that's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's Midsummer Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. <laughs> hey, Maniacs. How you doing? I hope everybody's doing great because it's December and the holidays are coming. It is. The holidays are coming for sure. But this is episode 21 of the podcast, A Worm in the Bud. Which, which is season five, episode two. Three. Three? Yep. Season five. Oh, that's right. Because of the controversy. Yes. Season five, episode three. Uh, Midsummer Maniacs is a podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, include the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we like to maniac out on. And as is usual, if your kids can handle the craziness of Midsummer Murders, they can handle the craziness of Midsummer Maniacs. This, this is a pretty tame episode, actually, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah, you know, it there's is. there's a little there's a little goings on, but not a lot of there's no dominatrixes or anything. Or incest or beheadings. Nope. Nope. <laughs> None of those things. So. Which are typical to an episode. Yes. <laughs> This is the exception. It's kind of tame. So it was filmed in September, October 2001. Broadcast date was the 23rd of June 2002, right near my birthday, actually. And 9.52 million viewers. Awesome. Directed by David Tucker and written by Michael Russell. Anything else at the top before we dive in? Uh, Nope. I think we uh, can dive right into the episode. So the cold opening uh, shows... Somebody tilling a field. This is James Harrington, right? Tilling a field. Yes. Whenever I see a British field being tilled, I'm just waiting for Time Team to show up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those things like, oh, you know, the farmers, they keep turning up these Romans to things, you know, and I just like that's the first thing that comes to my mind. So if you haven't watched Time Team, it's, I'm a, so broken. it's a British <laughs> television show in which... You know, it's Britain, so you go to a field and you turn over a rock and there's Roman pottery. Yeah, you know? just sitting there. Uh, it has fantastic, interesting people in it, and you should watch it. It's hosted by Tony Robinson, yes. who, who was in Black Adder, yep. amongst other things, and he's so great. They always have three days to do an entire dig, which would take a regular archaeologist like three seasons to dig. And you become fans of these archaeologist. Yeah, I didn't think I would be a fan of an archaeologist. <laughs> and Julie and her brother, Sean, are in the forest, and she's being mean to him. Well, she's just being an older sister, an older sibling. Okay. Telling o- him scary stories. O- older sisters are mean. They're in Set Whale Wood. I love you both. Um, <laughs> like they listen. Please. <laughs> this is something their little brother's doing. They're never going to listen. No, absolutely not. So they are wandering around in Set Whale Wood, which is kind of the centerpiece of the entire episode. People wandering around in a wood at the start of a midsummer episode. Guess what they find? <laughs> well, at least neither of them is killed, which could, which is the other, you know, possibility in a midsummer. Yeah, I don't think we. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head any dead children in the episode. Right. In any episode, I don't think so. That's that's a bridge too far. We yeah, can, I think we can so. sleep with our siblings and behead people, but we can't kill a kid. No, nope. just right out. No, nope. they've threatened lots of kids. Oh, yeah. but, but they haven't actually done it. So they're goofing around, talking about scary bears chasing them and stuff, and they come across a body laying face down in the bushes. And Snowy scares them off. Snowy. Snowy from Tintin. <laughs> He's a Jack Russell. Yes. Now, this is set in Midsummer Worthy, which apparently is the village of Jack Russells. Absolutely. There are a million Jack Russells. There's in this at least town. a dozen. Yep. Because that's how many Julie draws in her notebook. In her detective notebook. Yes. We quickly cut away to a courtroom. Yes. In which a judge is handing down a decision that be- on a case between Simon Bartlett and James Harrington. James Harrington owns Setwell Wood as part of his farm and wants to level it. He wants to cut down all the trees. I'm assuming putting in housing estates or something. Something like that. And Simon wants to stop him. But the judge 
rules in James's favor. And Bernard, Bernadette Sullivan is Simon's lawyer. And just by the way the camera lingers on her, you know that she's up to no good, too. Bernadette is played by Emily Joyce. Uh, she's also in A Christmas Haunting, which is a 2013 episode of Midsummer. I don't remember her in that episode. Here's something interesting about Emily Joyce, though. Okay. Before she decided to become an actor full-time, she was in a band. What band was she in? It's called In Spite of All That. Okay, it's a British band from the 80s I've never heard of. I could not find (laughs) anything. But she's one of two people in this episode who are also in, in bands. Tom and Troy are also in the courtroom, but it's a different courtroom. They're in the courthouse in a different courtroom. Yes. Yes. And they're testifying against a burglar. You know what my first thought was when I heard about this? Because he says he's a young man and he burgled houses all over the county. I think this is the butcher's son's trial. (laughs) Well, it's not Orlando Bloom's, right? Because he's good and dead. (laughs) No, he's good and dead. But But it could be his partner in crime's trial. And he gives him a second chance. The judge gives him a second chance. Boy, that's quite a window that he's been in jail awaiting trial, though. Well, you know, he's rotting on remand. Yeah. So So, uh, James and Simon come out of the courthouse and immediately get into a fight uh, because James is selling the wood and Simon's unhappy about it. Now, James Harrington, one of our key characters here, is played by Adam Kotz, K-O-T-Z. Um, He's also in another episode of Midsummer called The Dagger Club, which is a 2015 episode. He's the other person who's in a band. What band was he in? He's in a band that just broke up this year. Okay. Called Case Harden. H-A-R-D-I-N. Another British band I've never heard of. Well, there's a reason why you might not have heard of them. (laughs) Because they're not your typical British band. They are a UK alt-Americana country band. Wow. They put out five albums. This is James Harrington's in this band. Yes. He plays mandolin, guitar, banjo, and does some vocals. Wow. Yeah. It's British people singing country. Yeah. Oh, it's well, got to be interesting. Americana. <laughs> Whatever that is, right? In the middle of this altercation, James goes, nice day for it, Rector. The Rector is absolutely glued on here again in this. Yeah. Uh, but he needs to be there because British law is so complicated and goes back centuries and centuries. You know, there's all this complex history associated with it, especially with local common law. And the fact that the wood is associated with the church in some way means he's got to be there. It, it's a different kind of law than what we're used to here in the, in the colonies. Yeah, well, it just means that it can get complicated. Yes. But Bernadette is banking on that because according to the documentation, when the wood was given to the village or given sold from the rectory, that if it was ever sold again, half of it would go, half of those proceeds would go back to the rectory. And so the church has, has a stake in this. It's just another underdeveloped rector. It is, but he's scared. Yeah. He he does scared. (laughs) Well, so Now, they're outside the courthouse, and they're getting wet. Why would they be getting wet? You in the rain. (laughs) It's raining. Guys, I can't tell you how many times he paused this episode just to go, rain? No rain. Rain? Oh, look, the car's not wet. The ground's not wet. Oh, now it's raining again. It's actually raining. It's just this first day, and the time is way off on this first day. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy time. So the time and the rain get all screwed up because James goes to a playground. And when he goes to a playground to see his kids... It's daytime and it's not raining. It's 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 bone dry. He goes to see his wife, Caroline. And it's bone dry. It's not raining. The sun's still up. Then we have this window of time that we're not quite sure how long it takes. And right? in that tiny little bit of sunshine, we find out that James has been screwing... Simon's wife. So this whole wood thing is deeper than just land management. Yes. So James has been having an affair with Susan, who is Simon's wife. Simon is his opposition in this case. Susan and Simon. Yes. (laughs) Now, while we have this window of time where James goes pub hopping to get drunk. he's, He's drunk. 
Simon goes to Bernadette's because he's having a fling with her. Well, he he goes back to Bernadette's because we learned earlier he was there. He all was day there before, all night the right? day before. But we also know that worst farmer ever. Earlier in the day, before James left for court, Susan came to see him. Yes, right? at around eleven. But that's not even the crazy part. Okay, the crazy part of the day is once it gets dark. Yes. Right? James is good and drunk and driving around. Yep. Splashing and, people. And Simon is telling Bernadette he needs to get home, even though mm-hmm. she says his wife is a cow and he also has cows and none of them care when he gets home. He needs to cover up his tiny tuft of chest hair. Yes. Meanwhile, Denise and Sam Fielding, who are the parents of Julie and Sean, the, the kids in the wood, okay, are feeding their kids dinner. Okay. And when do you eat dinner in England? They might eat a little bit later than us. Maybe. But I think kids still go to bed at a decent time. Yes. Which I would say is nine o'clock. Which for kids who are under ten. If we're going by the clues in the rest of the show, it's ten or ten thirty. We know that Simon needs to be home by ten thirty. Yep. So he's leaving. So it's gotta be around ten, and he later confirms that it was about ten or ten thirty. Yep. So this means that the fieldings are they're feeding their kids dinner at 1030. No wonder their mom whips their plates off the table before they're done and sends them to bed. Yeah. But then Julie says, but it's not my bedtime. <laughs> when does this kid go to bed? Midnight? I, I don't know. The first day has all sorts of problems. They just have a lot to accomplish. And so they just ignore chronology. I keep in my notes at least two times on this page alone. I have in all capital letters. What time is it? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, during this torrential downpour with lightning and thunder going on, somebody is dragging a body in the woods. I, I don't understand why the killer knocks out this person with Valerian. Okay. It's Susan. Susan. And then puts her in the water. Why not just leave her where she is? Because she's not going to die. That's right. That's right. I said it and then I figured it out. Right. Yeah. So Susan's been poisoned with valerian. So she's unconscious face down in the wood, but she's not dead. That's right. The real question is why Victoria, who's the killer. Okay. We don't worry about spoilers nope. here. We assume everybody's watched it. Nope. This is a spoiler full, full episode. Did she drug Susan and then lose her? And she went into the woods and passed out and she couldn't find her for 24 hours? I guess. And then, like, Jonah found her because he had the dog. His dog goes where he wants to. But no, there's a person there that finds... The The dog is wandering around in the woods with Victoria. Oh. Jonah's dog hangs out with Victoria and Hannah more than it hangs out with Jonah. Ah. Because that dog goes where he wants to go, remember? And they've been all... they. The if three only of them had some friends. sausages. <laughs> the three of them have been friends for a long time. And so the dog is comfortable with them. And that's why his dog is in the wood. Well, it, it takes a lot of effort to get this body in the pond, which is much bigger than I realized when they show it later. When the body is being drug into it, it looks just like a low-lying area that's filling with rain. Yeah. Because the killer is not even up to his or her knees in the water. We know it's her, her knees in the water. And yet, later, we've got scuba divers. Yep. Oh, boy, do we have scuba divers. So it must have got real deep real fast. I, and it, it looks like it's like maybe a quarter mile across. If that. Yeah. It, 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 later on. It looks like a big puddle when we're putting the body in it. But, but later, it looks like a small a lake. <laughs> yeah. Later, it's a full-on pond. Hmm. Anyway. We also have a creepy shrine shown. The creepy shrine checklist includes candles. Check. Old pictures. Check. Weird music. Check. And shadows. Check. Okay. Ooh, don't forget old Bible. Old Bible. Yes. Check. And dead flowers. Dead flowers. Check. check. Okay. <laughs> We've got the shrine going. The shrine is set. <laughs> and it belongs to somebody. It belongs to Jonah. We just don't know it at the time. Okay. Next day. Cows. We know it's the next day. It's morning. They do a good job of telling us the sun is out now. (laughs) Yes. Simon has a dairy farm. Yes. And James 
plant something. Okay, we so don't we don't why. know if James has livestock, but we know he's planting. Yes. Okay. And we know Simon doesn't do that. No, Simon doesn't do that. And I'll get into what Simon does and doesn't do in a little while. But one thing James is doing here that you might not have figured out because you're not a farmer, what he's doing. So after you till the soil, right, with the plow, <laughs> we did wonder, and I need to go back and check to see if it's the same plow that uh, poor, what's his name, fell on. Oof. <laughs> I didn't want to think about that. Death. It was bad. So James is doing a thing called spreading manure, and this is not a euphemism. And it's not so much spreading as flinging. Yeah, so a, a manure spreader, you take a bunch of manure from where your cows, so he must have cows somewhere. Or he, is, or he gets it from another farm. No, because later on he's in a, po- a pond of animal excrement. Again, it could have been trucked in. It could have been. He, but... could, have been, he could be buying his shit somewhere and having it delivered. <laughs> I have to tell you, people would come and do that. I know. So you then put a bunch of manure on this tilled field so that the nutrients from what the animals ate act as fertilizer. Right. Now, he has what is called a horizontal manure spreader, right? So it flings the crap. That's what it's doing. Right. And it's distributing it in a spray behind the tractor. Yes. Right? And he has his window open, which you would never have your window open. Because you have to realize that this, when you do this in the farm, it showers everything with <laughs> shit. <laughs> well, and his window is covered in it. It, it, it is indeed. <laughs> But what's more interesting, a tiny digression here, is there is vertical. There's a vertical model? Yes, there is a vertical model. Why would you want to spray crap up? So this, a manure spreader has a a chain that pulls the manure towards the thing that flings it. That spins and flips it out, right? The traditional, original, the, the horizontal ones are new. The vertical ones are the original ones. And they would fling manure into the air and i'm talking 50 60 feet in the air is this like a i imagine like the wheel of a paddle boat going around and and it goes around really fast so doesn't it all end up on the tractor or it it flings it the other direction it flings it it away from the tractor. it flings it out the back towards (laughs) the field now, I remember as a kid watching this. I was going to say, the reason why you're even remotely interested in this is that you have childhood flashbacks <laughs> of manure spiders, and right? In addition, <laughs> I had a Massey Ferguson toy tractor and a Massey Ferguson toy manure spreader. Your parents really loved you. <laughs> here's son, here's a shit flinger for Christmas. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> it's one of those things that, you know, when people have this bucolic view of farming, I'm always like, are you ready to throw shit around? Because that's one of the things you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> you have to collect it. You got to load it up. And then you got to drive around and fling it everywhere. Oh, I asked my brothers and sisters about manure spreaders and they just shudder. <laughs> <laughs> and thus ends Mark's little farming trauma Episode, period of the oh, show. Oh, it'll come back. <laughs> Simon has a quad bike. Yes. And you noticed something about this quad bike. Well, the quad bike has a rack on the front of it, which most of them do, especially yep. when you use them on farms. And you put like a, a box or like a bin on the front of it. You can carry stuff. There's one on the back too. Yeah. And the one on the front of his changes color. It, well, sometimes it's black. Sometimes it's orange. Oh, well, it's nice that it changes color. Yeah. Well, it's not a big deal. Hannah and Victoria are doing the flowers at the church. And this is a thing, right? That the women of the village volunteer to decorate the church with flowers. Yes. A couple of things about the church. One, they're trying to raise 50K for a roof appeal. They're not even close. They only have 15K. (laughs) It's, it's It's a long way off. Is there a church in England that doesn't need a new roof? I want to know. I don't believe so. <laughs> it looks a lot like the church in Badger's Drift. It does. But I it know that there's common architecture in churches. Could possibly same be. Age. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Hannah and Victoria are there um, putting together the flower arrangements for the rector. Uh, so Victoria Bartlett, she's Simon's mom. Yeah. Right? And Hannah is James's mom. Yes. So their mothers are friends, even though they are enemies. Yes. Now, Victoria is played by Wendy Craig. Okay. And a couple interesting things about Wendy. She's, she's had an incredibly long career. She's been in stuff years and years and years, right? I mean, she's an older lady, so um, she's been in lots of stuff. She has two sons. And just a few years ago, even though her sons are grown men, I'd love to know how this got out. Okay. In some, in some way, it was revealed that her second son is not her husband. Oh. Now, her husband has died, but, okay. but that instead, her second son, whose name is Ross, yes. is the result of an affair that she had with John Mortimer, whose name probably doesn't ring a bell to you. He's famous because he wrote Rumpel of the Bailey. Oh, that's where I know that name from. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But what I found even more interesting was a movie that she was in. Okay. In 1965, she okay. was in a 1965 movie. British movie. Yeah. There's a good chance I've seen this movie. It's a Hammer movie. Oh, it's a Hammer movie. <laughs> it's got Betty Davis in it. Oh, Betty Davis in a Hammer movie? Yes. Okay. It's called Nanny. Oh, Nanny, I've seen. Yes. She plays, yes. and um, Wendy Craig plays the mother. Yeah. And Nanny. Okay. Whoa, what a plot yeah. this movie has. So lay it on us. So a little boy is released from a special school that he's been sent to because he is somehow bad. Bad. Right? And it's not really clear why he's bad. But when his dad comes to get him from the special school, he's just played a joke on all the teachers by pretending to hang himself. Oh. He's that kind of kid. That... that, that? Is special. Right? Yeah. So bad. They, but so they bring him home, they're gonna love him and he's gonna be normal again, right? They're gonna help him out. Yes. And they've brought in a nanny. Yes. Who's Betty Davis. Oh. Nothing's gonna go wrong. No, no. Right? It's not good. And so the whole movie is is he said, she said. He's saying to his parents, Nanny's evil and she's trying to kill me. And Nanny's like of course not. I would never do that. And they're like, well, the kid is kind of broken and, you know, he's kind of crazy. So maybe we shouldn't believe him. And she's nanny's like, of course you shouldn't believe him. I'm not homicidal. Meanwhile, she's trying to kill him left, right and center. Absolutely. Has killed other people. Yep. All over the place. Kill her nanny. But it ends with her, with him, underwater in a bathtub, holding him down, about to kill him. And then she just changes her mind. Oh, well, you know. The that end. happens. The end. Ta-da. <laughs> but but Wendy Craig plays this this great she's so good as the mother because she's absolutely she's neurotic and her her son's a little loopy. Her daughter was was killed somehow. You don't know exactly how, and we think that maybe her son is the one who killed the daughter, and that's why they send him to the special place, right? And so she is. She, she's just falling apart for two hours. Oh, basically. Well, she's right at home in a midsummer until the end when Betty Davis doesn't kill her son, and then he's like, "Oh, I love you, mommy," and she's like, "I love you too," and everything's going to be okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> what have we learned from this? Don't hire Betty Davis as your nanny. No. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> But Wendy Craig was in a few movies in that era that were kind of of that ilk. There's, yeah. You look through her IMDb history, there's some fun ones in there. Yeah, I'm sure. She was in another movie with Oliver Reed where he plays an ad agent who's going nuts. And Oh, I think I've seen that. Yeah. I can't remember the title, but yeah. I had the, that Oliver Reed thing in high school They're where we super watched fun. as many Oliver Reed movies as we could. So yeah. Sam is out in Setwell Wood. Yep. And he's exercising the hounds that belong to the Midsummer Hunt. And he took Julie with him. Is this hunt pack the same hunt pack from the episode? With the hunt? With the hunt. Is that the Midsummer Hunt pack as well? It may be, but remember that had a different hunt master. Maybe he's, maybe though they've changed. He, maybe he's the new hunt master. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't review it. I should have reviewed it. Yeah, because Sam and his wife, Denise, think that, you know, Julie and Sean are just making up stories, right? Yeah. So he wants to take Julie out, show her that there's no body, and then 
they'll be done with it and that'll be the end of it. It's going to shock her, basically. But no, I think he's Not just... Not shock her, It's but... like when you say there's a boogeyman in the closet, you open the closet and you show the kid there's yeah. nobody in the closet and then that's the end of it, right? So we're going to go to the wood, there's not going to be a body and you're going to stop talking about it. But instead, there is a body. we're going to do body. this with Julie, not Sean. Why? Because Sean's not going on about it. Okay. Right? Well, you know. And if Julie doesn't think it happened, then, then Sean won't either. But of course, then they find Susan in the pond. Yes. Very good dead body acting here. Yeah. Like in the water, face down, no movement. Seemingly face down. I don't think her face is actually in the water. No, I don't think so. I either. think she's up on her knee. On, her elbows. Yeah, or laying on a box or something. Something. Because this on. is not deep water. No, 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 no. But he turns her over, and she she does a pretty good uh, wet dead body. Yeah. The both, well, a number of dead bodies in this episode are covered with stuff, crap, literally in some cases, and yeah, they do a very good job. She's here. lucky. She only has to be covered in water. So two things about this scene caught my attention because oh well, a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> right scene of the crime comes and tom pulls up in a police van did they come and get him in that van yeah i don't know why he, i mean it's typical for troy to be there first yeah a sergeant that's kind of his job yeah so maybe he was driving the car well he checks it out and then he calls barnaby right he goes yeah this is this you, is you need it. to come by. yeah we need to look at this yeah and then the second part of the scene of the crime scene is a guy Two guys in wetsuits in the background. I don't know why they're there. <laughs> we already know the water is not even waist deep. Why do you need a scuba suit? Well, they don't do much back there, but look <laughs> uncomfortable. Stand around half dressed in scuba suits talking to each other at a distance. It, they're not looking for a gun or anything in the water. I don't no. know what the point is. I, I don't know. No. Right. I don't know. Every time I see James, because James and Simon were in a fight outside the courthouse, and Simon punched him in the mouth, James's lip gets busted. Yeah. And so he's got this, uh, like a scab on his lip. Yes. But every time I see him after that, I think he's got a lip ring. Yes. Because it looks like a lip ring. <laughs> perfectly up and down, straight. Yeah, it's just a line on his bottom lip. I'm like, oh, he's a punky farmer. Yeah. Wearing his lip ring. <laughs> No, it's a busted lip. So he's upset with the vic with the director because he thinks they're in cahoots. Yeah, and the woods is all blocked off to James now. Yeah, which he assumes is Bernadette's doing, right? Yeah, to stop him from felling any trees, but in reality, it's because there's a body in there. Yeah. So now we go to Simon's farm, and I have some problems. Okay, so he has, as far as I can tell, from roughly looking at it. Probably around 60 to 100 head of cattle. Welcome to another episode of Mark's Farm Trauma. <laughs> so having 60 to 100 head of cattle means a couple of things. Most farmers, most dairy farmers, either milk their cows twice a day, mm -hmm. which means they're on a 12-hour rotation, mm -hmm. or three times a day, which okay. means they're on an eight-hour rotation. Mm -hmm. Okay. To uh, And they milk. do it by machine. Yes. Right now. Yes. With roughly 10 to 12 milking machines, which they don't have, okay? Well, there is that big UFO-looking rack of machines yeah. with the glowing green neon. That's in the... four milking machines. Oh, so they can milk four cows at a time? Yes. Oh. So if you can milk 10 cows at a time, you will take four hours a day to milk all those cows each twice. Each time? No, no, twice. Oh. So each time it takes two hours? Yes. And that's with 10 machines. Yes. So it's going to take them three times that, roughly. Yes. So, so now we're into 12 hours of milking. A day. Which really means by the time he's finished, he needs to milk them again. And this is where Jonah Blocks, a master milker, comes in. <laughs> <laughs> because he is the greatest farmhand ever. He does everything. Now, no human being can run 10 milking machines at one time. Well, they only have four, so that's good. The, <laughs> <laughs> There's just too many cows and not enough milking machines. Never mind that the milk that comes out of those machines has to go into big, big vats, big vats that have to be like then, refrigerated, like and tested, and kept a milk truck and that then, comes every yeah. day, and all, all there's 
they leave the farm quickly because I think the director is like, I don't understand how farms work, so let's get into the farm's office, which is absolutely okay. Yeah. Because a farm needs an office. So I have to say, as a kid who did not grow up on a farm, I have always been highly amused by the fact that they call the barn where the milking happens the milking parlor. The parlor. It's always made me think of, like, Elsie the cow sitting on a wingback chair with some doilies being milked. <laughs> Welcome to the milking parlor. So, we have tea and our teeth pulled. So <laughs> two more things about this scene. First of all, he mentions AI, and that's not artificial intelligence. No, no. Those cows are being set up for artificial insemination. Oh. Yes. That's a different AI. Wow, and, that movie would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> and Jonah says that machine or that thing doesn't understand when the cows are ready for AI. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking of that little kid in that Spielberg movie coming around to artificially inseminate people. <laughs> oh, that's gross. He's Haley so- Jaws Osmond as an inseminator. He's so scary. <laughs> oh, oh, but puts that's a so- different role of Jude Law in that movie. Yeah. That's for sure. That's okay because Simon has software to manage all that, right? Yes, he has the Daily Herd Report. <laughs> Okay, so this is a Windows 2000 computer, and Daily Herd Report, not a real program. They absolutely made this program thing. That's impressive. Um, The Herd number is 08-67587-01, Grange Farm Bartlett. It's a herd management app. Oh. Yes. It looks pretty realistic. Yeah. They also use an email app, and this is the first time for Windows 2000, the first time for email on Midsummer, and there's a mention of the web later on. Yeah. This is a very tech episode. Mm. So the application they use for email is called Office Talk, which is not a real application. Well, they couldn't show a real one. No, they couldn't show a real one. And there's an email from Susan Bartlett, which says, I have to face the truth now. No more pretending. I'd rather be dead then live with it, at least you can start again. Which I immediately said, it should be at least comma. You can start again. Well, you know what I thought? What? I thought Office Talk was well ahead of its time because it can um, send and receive emails from dead people. Yes, it's it's amazing. It should that be it does called that. Ghost Mail. Ghost Mail. Ghost Mail. Yeah, because she, she would have had to have sent that email after she was at least unconscious in the wood, but probably dead. So if Simon goes a little berserk, which he would if, you know, I think Simon loved his wife, but I don't think he actually liked her. Well, speaking about artificial insemination. (laughs) Yeah. They'd been going through a whole bunch of fertility treatments, and I think that had kind of taken over their lives. Yes. And it kind of, and they weren't successful, so it had driven them apart. So they weren't talking as much as they used to. They didn't spend any time together. And it's easy to think that maybe he didn't care about her, but he did love her. Yeah. They just hadn't had a good relationship recently. Yeah, I think I think so. Uh, so Troy almost kills him. Yes, <laughs> they play chicken. This is almost the exact same scene as the, the Freddy scene from the last episode, except for this person is actually upset for a valid reason. And Tom doesn't seem upset. As they're careening towards Simon and his no. Land Rover. no. Tom's not like, stop, slow down, whatever. You know, he's like, keep going. Yep. (laughs) Hit him. Hit him. We're going to stop this guy. Um, Because for all they know, it's Simon making a run for it, right? Because he killed his wife. Yeah. So they got to stop him. Yeah. In reality, I think he would have just off-roaded and driven around them. He's mean to Tom. I don't like that. He's mean to Tom because he doesn't know who he is. And he's upset. He's not as mean to Tom as his mom is to him. Boy, when Victoria shows up, she's got some tough words for Simon. Absolutely. But she's a mom. She's going to have tough words. So they go in and talk to Simon about what's going on and farmers keep unsociable hours and blah, 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 blah. Right? Uh, Meanwhile, I'm obsessed with the bulletin board because there's pictures of her and a brochure for the spring at Harmony Hall where they're doing a uh, session called Learning to Listen. (laughs) Well, she's got all kinds of like... Natural remedy, yeah, holistic stuff, like, stuff right? Yeah. Because she's trying to get pregnant and just, you know, learning anything that she can. 
So she's going to go to the learn to listen session? Yes. Yeah. And Troy talks to Bloxham in the barn because he's got nothing to do. I, I don't understand how Bloxham has any time to do anything in this episode. Well, he can milk 60 cows in like 15 minutes because the cows are gone now, right? Yep. He cows. spends all of his time eavesdropping and hosing things off. Yep. And telling Troy that he saw Susan at James's farm. Jonah Bloxham is played by Ian Hogg, who's been in a gazillion things. Yes. Right? A gazillion things. Yeah, he's that familiar face guy. The most intriguing thing, though, that I found in his long list of roles was a TV show, or it might have been a miniseries, from 87 called Boogie Outlaws. Oh, that's not the only boogie that we'll get to in this episode. It's about a disco band on the run. <laughs> boogie Outlaw. From the law. <laughs> wow. I couldn't find a clip of it. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Boogie Outlaws. Boogie Outlaws. Boogie, boogie outlaws. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom and Troy are going to go talk to James now. Yes. Right? Because Jonas said, we saw Susan, he saw Susan um, at James's house. And they don't yet know that James and Susan had a thing, right? This no, is kind they of how don't. they know. James tells them. Yeah. Before that, though, we have a little more scenes with Julie and Sean, right? Because essentially, they're on the lookout for Jack Russell. Which Tom is kind of dismissed, like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And Tom says you could should keep this as a secret and, you know, things like that. And while they're talking to the kids, I'm immediately thinking... Wait a minute. How old are these children now? So the Julie is played by Clarissa Holt, mm -hmm. who is actually 27 now. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Hicks, who is Sean, I couldn't get a, an age on him. Clarissa Holt is the sister of Nicholas Holt, who you might know is uh, all over the place in films now. He uh, was um, a Nikola Tesla in the... Current War, he's the Beast in the new X-Men series of movies. And Charlie was in a movie called Fungus the Boogeyman. Yes. <laughs> it's a straight-to-VHS movie. Yes, it's, it's an animated movie. It's animated. It's kind of a Shrek yeah. look-alike. But uh, I thought Fungus the Boogeyman was... <laughs> now, now, I wonder, if because it's British, I wonder if it's Fungus the Bogeyman or Fungus the Boogeyman. Well, I can tell you that um, Ian Hogg's TV show was not Bogey Outlaws, because that would be different. <laughs> <laughs> They're on the run for picking their noses. Bougie Outlaws. <laughs> <laughs> James's house is interesting to me. Oh, it's so interesting. His wife has been gone for a year, so this is a, a year bachelor or two. pad, right? Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of a mess. He's a farmer. He's kind of dirty and... The house is kind of dirty, but I'm sort of confused by his kitchen. Yes. He's got an auga. Yep. Right. And my understanding of these stoves is that they're, they're basically cast iron stoves and they serve not only as a thing to cook on, but they also are kind of the furnace of the house at the same time. Sometimes they I think. stay hot yep. internally all the time and create heat. And the idea is that, that both of these farms are, well owned by the family, 500 years in the case. Yeah, of, they go way back. Yeah. And so you would expect that they would be pretty well equipped Yeah, after all that time. But Troy leans against the stove with his backside and both of his hands. Yeah. And I thought they were hot on top, sort of. I thought they were warm. I, I, I worry about Troy touching anything. But above the stove is the nastiest rag I've ever seen. Just hanging there. It's just gross. Yeah. Right above the stove. Anyway. I, I don't think James is that great of a cook. No, I don't think so either. But that's just the first of two kitchen mysteries. We'll get to another one later. So Susan drowned six hours after Julie and Sean saw her in the woods. Yeah. So we now know for sure that the person we've seen dragging a body in the rain the night before is somebody dragging Susan into the pond. That's yes. sure. And we know, and we're going to find out is Victoria dragging her into the pond. And Barnaby and Troy are discussing this at the police station and Barnaby goes off into weirdness territory. 
Is this where he does the I saw the man upon the stairs thing? I saw the man upon the stairs thing. Again, I've mentioned it before. I have a PhD in literature. Yep. I have two master's degrees in English. Yes. And for some reason, every time I hear that poem, I think it's Emily Dickinson. It's not. And the, I don't know why. The poem is called Antigonish. It's by Hughes Mearns. From Nova Scotia. It's a Canadian poem. Yep. I looked and looked and looked to see whether my confusion about that was common. Like, did Emily Dickinson have a poem similar? And that's why I think that it, that it was her. It's a common trope, meeting a man on the stairs with no name. Yeah, but I, I, I think it's a Berenstein Bear thing. I think in, a, in another dimension, she wrote it and I got it in my head. I don't know. The poem is originally about a ghost. Because mm-hmm. he, he read a report that there was this house in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, that had a ghost that was on the stairs. And that part that Barnaby recites is only a small part of the poem. Yeah, it's not very. It's not a huge poem, but it's only part of it. Yeah, and it's been referenced in a whole bunch of other things. Bernadette is an extremely successful barrister. Why? Why would you say that? Because she has a flat in London, which most normal people can't afford to begin with. Yes. And a really beautiful Georgian house. Where she always puts stuff on the mantle. Did you notice that? Yeah. She's always putting stuff on the mantle. But, I mean, it's a beautiful house. It's got big French windows yeah. with leaded glass. It's got high ceilings. It's got beautiful moldings. It's wood beautiful. floors. It's a gorgeous home. And that's her occasional place. Yeah. The one that she leaves, you know, when she's bonking Simon. Yeah, you know, to go to London. The Simon Bonking House. It's just nice. I'm glad to see single women doing well for themselves. Yep. She didn't make up the spare bed. (laughs) I love that line. (laughs) That night also something weird happens. And so this is a thing with me in Midsummer. I'm always like, what is the episode where they make the dead body thing out of flowers? This oh, it's is this one. This is the episode. So somebody cuts the fl- the tops off flowers and makes a extremely proportionate, well defined dead body kind of chalk drawing out of the flowers in the dark. In the dark. And it's James. Yeah, I'm worried about this because first of all, do we see James not drunk other than in court? Well, even if he's if he's drunk, he still does a really good job. What concerns me is that he's even cut the flowers off of her climbing vines. Yes. So he climbed up the house. To cut the flowers off. Still, he does a really good job. He does. Like he's got a, like a career here that he doesn't know about. He, he does. He, he should be doing flower arrangement. Or chalk outlines of bodies. Something. <laughs> and Hannah discovers this. Yeah. With her hair. You don't like Hannah's bob. I don't know I don't what you like got her against fringe. her bob. I don't like her fringe bothers me. Tom and Troy go and search Simon's house, find the laptop, find out that the email was sent after Susan died. So somebody accessed yeah. this laptop. Simon says he's never touched it. James says he's never touched it. And he freaks out about the search, which, of course, is completely understandable. Yeah, if somebody's digging around in your house. But then they do a purposely different scene where James is like, oh, you can look whatever around my house. I don't yeah, care. And then hide. And yeah, Susan used to like bang on about the web all the she time. She was on and on about gynecological sites. Are you sure that's where she was going? And tarot card sites. She was trying to get pregnant. I She's guess. desperate. I don't know if that stuff was on the web at 2000. Message boards. Yep. Mmm, sausages. So here's the second of three kitchen mysteries. So the first one was, can you lean on an auger without getting burnt? The second one is Julie goes into the Fielding family kitchen and gets sausages out of the fridge that they're going to lure dogs with mm, so they can sausages. check out all of the Jack Russells. I do not understand how British families survive with a basically dorm fridge. Yeah, we have two full-sized fridges. Now, we have a big family, but... We've only got one or two more kids than they do. I have a fridge that big in my office, uh, in my room at school. Yeah. And yet, not only do British families survive with small refrigerators, they survive with a washer but no dryer. Well, they they wear small clothes and eat small meals. Or they go to the store every day. Maybe that's why they have the distance thing. Yeah. Because they're all we. <laughs> they're tiny people, and that's why things seem so far apart. 
I guess. But she steals some big old sausages. Yep. And then they feed them all to one dog. That little mm. Jack Russell should nom, explode. Nom, 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 nom. And then Troy gets all techie. He's got a camera. He does. He goes to take pictures of the body outline. Of, My boss the is going to want to see this. And he's like turning it sideways. Never do we see fancy. Barnaby looking at it. No, I guess we can assume that he did. But this is before digital cameras, and right? He meets them at the Golden Ball, which is uh, the pub for this episode, which has fine ales and stouts, home cooked food, morning coffees and afternoon teas. And by the way, children welcome. I'd like to go there. Yes. I, I wish we had a pub. I wish like we that. had a pub. Simon and Bernadette get into it because she's all, well, now that your wife's dead, you can be with me and I can give you everything you want and we can get the wood back and blah, 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 blah. And of course, he's like, she's not even buried yet. <laughs> and then Bernadette drops this awesome line. What's the decent period for abstaining from your mistress when your wife has died? So I, I wonder this question. I did too. Did you Google it? No. <laughs> of all the strange searches we do because of this show, I really didn't want to do that one. <laughs> Most of what I found was how do you respond when your husband's mistress dies and he's upset? Ooh. Well, that, that happened in the last episode. That happens in Dark Harvest. Yeah, there's a lot about that. But according to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. Now, it's not specifically a rule about when you can sleep with your mistress after your spouse dies. Okay. But the mourning period for the death of a spouse is one year and one day. One year and one day. It's very specific. Uh, Bernadette's not going to wait that long. I don't think so. She's she's a fast lady. She, she She's wants, a big city lady. She wants some Simon sausage before that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, now I'm thinking of what's his name? Haley Joe Osmond or whatever his name is. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> they're like walking in like all roboty, going, "I'm here. <laughs> I'm AI." <laughs> <laughs> I'm so wrong. I'm so broken. And they follow a bunch of puppies, including to the Midsummer Worthy stores and post office, where they see Busker. Busker's a little scared to be on camera. Mm-hmm. A little terrified. He's cute. I just wonder if there was a dog wrangler who brought like six Jack Russells to town to to film. Yeah, because they're definitely not all the same dog. Because some of them have are like kind of longer, wiry haired terriers, and some of them are short, smooth terriers. Yeah, there's a so many. Hannah and Victoria are hanging out, and they talk to Tom, and they've been friends since they were little. We since they were we we. These are two women who both have raised sons that they don't like. Yeah. The, uh, a sort of thread that runs through this episode, two of two threads. One is children that you raise that you don't like as adults because mm -hmm. they don't like their kids. No. And second is absentee fathers. Yeah. Both fathers are never even mentioned. We just assume that they died. Because yeah. Victoria does say when your dad died... Oh, so that's we right. know Simon's father's died. Yeah. <laughs> and then sausage gets turned into a verb. Yes. Julie's, sausage it, Sean, sausage it. Because <laughs> Jonah's dog is, is like going to rip their faces off. <laughs> These are he comes out with a knife. He's a scary old man he at this is. point. And I don't know what he says. He says some line. It, so the... <laughs> the subtitles for this episode, at least on Acorn, are not that great. No. There's a lot of errors in them, right? And so you can't rely on them when you're not sure what somebody said. They really have trouble with the fieldings. But when Jonah chases Julie and Sean away from his cottage with the knife, I swear. It's weird what he says. What he says is, you will know the wiped ass of a wrath of God. I swear that's what he says. It sure sounds like that. <laughs> if it's not, if somebody else hears it differently, please tell me what it please, is he said. Please tell us what he I said. Because I swear he says, you'll know the wiped ass of a wrath of God. <laughs> as he chases him with the big knife. It's very weird. Very strange. <laughs> So they come home, and first of all, they talk into 
the dad, and Sean is playing Disney's Aladdin in Nazaria's Revenge, a PS1 game, mm-hmm. which I spent like 10 minutes looking up that game <laughs> <laughs> to find out what it was. And then Sean just completely gives her up. Oh, yeah, we were pretending to be detectives. Yeah. she's Julie wants it to be a secret. Their poor mother, Denise, Sam's wife, all she does is laundry and cook. Yep. And chase these kids around and Well, fret. she tries to teach them how to garden, and certainly Sean is not the best at it. Denise is played by Rosie Cavaliero. Yeah. She's also in A Vintage Murder in 2015, Another Midsummer. The role that she has had in the past that Rosie Cavaliero has played in the past that I think is most fun is she plays Peggy Hodgson in um, the Enfield Haunting movie. She's the mother of the the daughter who's got this poltergeist. And Rosie Cavaliero plays the mother in the the movie version of the Enfield Haunting. And I can imagine her doing a super good job at that that role. Because she's certainly a harried mother in this episode of Midsummer. Yes. Kids go to bed, and I am obsessed with Sean's sheets. That sounds kind of weird. So the first time they show Sean in bed, I'm like, Does that look like a Kansas City Chiefs logo? Now, the Kansas City Chiefs are an NFL football team. Yeah. Which is American football. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, it can't possibly be a Kansas City Chiefs logo because, you know, what kid in Britain is going to have NFL blankets? Guess what? Sean is the kid in in Britain with NFL blankets. So he you could clearly see the Philadelphia Eagles logo. You could clearly see the Green Bay Packers logo. It says Vikings in the Vikings font. Like, I'm not a football fan, but that's an NFL blanket. That's a, it's an mm. inter- interesting um, scene setting decision on their part. Yeah, like, why would a kid in England have that? Maybe he likes American football. I, but they would have had to get that special. Like, yeah. Even weirder than that is that Barnaby puts his home address in the back of his business cards. Yeah, that's weird, too. Why would he do that? I don't know. Like, so that Julie could find him. His home number? Maybe. Maybe. His cell number? Maybe. But not his home address. That's weird. But, you know, if if he didn't, Joyce wouldn't be in this episode. Yes. So at the Golden Ball, they have a kind of wake for Susan... And James makes an ass of himself because that's what he does. Yeah. He annoys his mom and his ex-wife. And we know that something is up, right? Because Mm -hmm. Simon stops by James's house before this. And we know that there's a dog barking there. He's got an Australian shepherd. Yeah, a, br- a, a sheep, very pretty a dog. dog. Yeah. yeah, and so does Simon. They George, both is the do- dog's name George? No, George is the Russell Terrier. Okay. And James passes out, and then somebody shows up. To first swap the bottle that he's been drinking from well, to remove the poisons evidence. poisons the dog it, first. Right. Poisons the dog with valerian and a piece of meat. Then swaps out the bottle to take away the poisoned bottle. Yes. And leave an empty bottle of regular old booze. Yes. Rolls him off the couch. He's so passed out, he doesn't even wake up when he's rolled off the couch. It's like a dead body. But then the killer wheels in a dolly. (laughs) How do you load a passed out floppy body on a dolly? I don't know. I spent a good five minutes trying to figure it out, and I can't figure it out. I mean, if you laid the dolly flat on the ground... You could sort of roll them over onto the back of the dolly. Especially if you're Victoria. I don't think she can carry a, a dead weight James. I don't think so either. A wheelbarrow wouldn't be much easier. No. It, there's a flaw. There's a reason why they cut. Yeah. Well, and then I'm thinking, so he's unconscious, drunk and drugged, and now she's going to put him on a dolly, wheel him out in the rain and the mud, and dump him in this manure pool... Manure, yes. By the way, <laughs> if you see a sign for the manure pool, don't go in it. <laughs> Turn the other way. And dump him into it, which wouldn't have been easy either without getting in. Oh, she would have been covered with manure. And plus it was raining again. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why she got it rinsed off. <laughs> maybe. Because she wears not just wellies, she wears waders. Yeah, she wears waders and a long coat. Yeah. So those are like rubber pants, not just boots. They have to get him out of the manure pool with a forklift. And it's a tiny thing. But I was like, 
Okay, so she gets him on the thing, and then she gets him towards the manure pool. And then I'm like, I'm a farm kid, because I'm like, she's left a gate open somewhere. The cows are going to get out. <laughs> but we don't even know if he has livestock. Well, he's got manure, and that's not home produced. No. <laughs> but like I said earlier, he could get it delivered from he another could, farm. He could get it. Maybe Simon sells him manure. Yeah. Because that's one thing dairy farmers do do. Do do. <laughs> They sell their doo doo. That's what they, they sell their doo doo. <laughs> so the next day, Julie and Sean go on their big adventure with the with the the, poli- the bus driver who's like, "Shouldn't you be in school?" And they're like, "No, big adventure." He's like, "Okay." No, Julie <laughs> says we're doing something important. Yeah, and he's like, "Okay." <laughs> he doesn't have time to be bothered with that. That's a cute little bus, though. I was like, I wonder if I could get a bus like that and drive around and pick up kids. <laughs> Okay, that's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> they they go to Tom's house, and of course he's not home because he's at work. So, Joyce! So Joyce is there. and Like an hour into the episode before we see Joyce. Yeah, and they're hungry, and so Joyce gives them cake, and Sean actually likes the cake, which to me means it's store-bought. Yes. It must be store-bought <laughs> because they like it. Though Joyce says, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. So maybe she's actually able to make edible cake, but nothing else. Maybe. We go back to the farm, and James is being pulled out of the pool. With a forklift. And boy, he is covered in something. I don't know what it is. It sure looks like wet manure. It's all over his face and his body. You know, uh, the first dead body was good acting, but I think James takes the cake here. We don't actually see him floating in the pool. No, but... The first time we see him, he's already on the forklift, but he's clearly been coated in something gross. Even the most inoffensive thing it could be is still gross. Yes. It's kind of wiped off his face. Well, you know, it's not as gross as what jo- what uh, Troy has to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Because the dog's been poisoned too, but he's largely vomited it up right yeah but they don't know what was used to poison him what we used to, use to drug him well there's a way to find out what you was can, used to drug you can him. test the vomit right so, which means somebody's got to collect the vomit barnaby says there sure is a lot of dog vomit in there get as much as you can <laughs> I know, my first question is where is Sako? because they would be cleaning that up they're kind of in the background and if Troy's smart, he's going to turn around and say, can one of you yeah. collect that? Because Troy, we have to remember, Troy is second in command at this scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, all the uniform guys would answer to Troy. Right. So, Simon is freaking out with Bernadette. <laughs> because he's got Again. no alibi. He's, he went to James's farm. And she's like, oh, well, I'll just create an alibi for you. And... You can tell she's calculating. Yeah. She, I know that he suggests that maybe she's creating an alibi for herself, really. But what she's truly doing, and she admits it later, is preparing to be able to blackmail him. Yeah. To say, you're going to be with me, whether you like it or not, because if you leave me, I'm going to tell. Yep. She's, Which is not what a good lawyer does. She's, she's not a very nice person. No. May we see some detecting, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> May we turn the lights on in the car? No. Simon's rather messy at this point, though, because he just rifles through his own drawers to find that photograph album of badly photoshopped pictures. To remind himself of how much he loved his wife. Yeah, Who I is guess now so. dead. I guess so. Jonah is the best farmhand ever. Okay, he milks all the cows. He washes the ATV. Mows he, the grass. He mows the grass. No, this is, how much is he getting paid? Really, he's running the farm because we know that Simon was away for over a day the day before. Well, I think he, Jonah feels like it's his farm. I, I think so. I think Jonah feels like it's his farm. Yeah. But he's got this shrine, right, with the photos of the girls. <laughs> Strange noises, candles, and then dead we, flowers. We get to what I think is the most disappointing element of this episode. Okay. Which is the dog bite. Yes. Tom goes to see Jonah and his dog, Charlie, who's been sausaged, is apparently still hungry 
for John Tom. John sausage it. <laughs> for Tom meat. And supposedly bites his hand. I don't expect them to show a dog actually biting Tom. Nope. But the way Tom complains about it, you'd think the bite would have at least broken the skin. Or half his hand would be off. But Tom never has a bandage. Nope. He just continually complains. He's with, got nature's remedy, though. With his palm facing him so that we can't see the injury. Yeah. And Jonah gives him a concoction, which I assumed you would apply to the wound. Well, it's a miracle concoction because it clears it up immediately. No, because his hand's still hurting at the end of the episode. Well, the it hurts, but it, it gets rid of the... It heals it. It heals it like it would be in a 1950s gladiator movie. They could have at least put a Band-Aid on his hand. I would think to so. To make it look as if he had an injury. It's yeah. such an important thing that they keep referencing, and yet they don't bother... I mean, as far as we know, it's just a bruise. Yeah. And what's the big deal about that? Yeah. We do find out that the shrine is Jonah's, though. Yes, for sure. And it's there are pictures of Victoria and Hannah as little girls because the three of them used to play together. And though that was an important Victoria part of his completely life. ignores him at the farm. I'm like, Victoria's son isn't very nice, but Victoria's not very nice. Well, she's the killer, so. <laughs> she's not very nice. <laughs> Next. We see George in the largest morgue ever. We've seen that morgue before. It's it's a huge set. It's the fancy morgue. It's, it's got the big light. It's Valerian in yeah. concentrated form, which is what they used to call set well. Mm-hmm. And then we find out that James' wife had a bunch of insurance on him. Yeah, like, Car- Caroline had life insurance on James that she continued to maintain even after they separated. Ooh. What insurance company did they use? <laughs> Hopefully not the same one that had um, Tom's uh, retirement. No, they used Red Herring Insurance Company because that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> well, speaking of Red Herrings, Jonah's planting evidence to frame Simon. Right? Yeah. He plants the liquor bottle with the Valerian in it. He takes hair off of Susan's hairbrush and puts it on the ATV because, you know, you just randomly have a clump of hair yeah. Just sitting there. Especially after you've washed it, which, like, when he put it on the first time I was watching it, I'm like, didn't you wash that before? Which is what Tom says later on. I can only imagine, though, that... The, so the reality of this is that you're taking a clump of hair from a baggie that he's put it in, going to the ATV, which is outside, planting the hair on the the logical place where her hair would have been if he had thrown her body on there to drive yeah. it out to the woods. And then he must have stood around and went, God, I hope the wind doesn't blow. Don't let the wind blow. Don't let the wind blow. You know, don't let Simon come out and try to ride it around. Yeah. But the frame up works. It works. And they send him off to the pokey. Yeah. Simon gets taken away because Jonah's fine with that. Because he doesn't want Simon to sell the farm because then he would have to leave the farm. So he's fine for Simon to go to prison. So in the back of, in the nick, there's a sign on the wall, which sent me on a whole thing. What's this sign? It says, do traveling costs put prison visits out of reach? <laughs> and then I was like, that's an intricate security safety net system in which you're paying families of convicts money so that they can travel to see their convicts. Mm-hmm. And it, It is a level of respect and really understanding of convicts that I don't think happens in this country. (laughs) No, I don't think that. I mean, there might be some charities who support families. Can you imagine if the government gave money to families? To help them travel. To help them travel. No. no, That would never happen in the U.S. Nope, nope, nope. You're in the pokey, you're in the pokey. Yep. And they can move you to a prison halfway across the country. Yeah, if you're a federal crime. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, before they take Simon away in the car, they're in his kitchen, and this is the third kitchen mystery. So can you lean on Naga? How do British people operate with just a tiny refrigerator? And what is the damn thing in Simon's kitchen? So there's a counter yep. that has then ha- has a low spot in the counter, and then it goes back up again. Yep. Above it on the wall is a grill. It's a salamander. I know what that is. That's where you make cheese on toast. Yeah. I know what that is. But below that, in this kind of lowered part of the counter, there's... Like a metal cover? Like a metal cover, and he's got booze bottles sitting on it. Yeah, it's weird. Maybe it's over a sink? 
No, because the sink is underneath the yeah, window. Oh, that's right. But I don't think it's the cooktop either because we see that on a different wall. And you wouldn't put alcohol bottles on top of a cooktop. Uh, I don't know. You thought maybe it was like a freezer. Maybe. But it's built into the yeah, cabinet, it's built into whatever the cabinet. it is. So if somebody can figure it out, let us know. Maybe he took something out of it and put it in Jonah's hole. <laughs> well, Jonah's putting everything else in his hole. Not the paraffin heater, though. The still. Yes. That he uses for the valerian yes. root. And bottles. Yep. And all kinds of random equipment. He's just throwing it into the ground. And then I think he builds a fire pit on top of it to burn stuff, to kind of cover it up. He does a better job. Jonah does a better job with his hole than, than Joan did in, in the, the prior last episode. episode. Yeah. So he's reading his Bible, and then he has a visitor. Who conks him on the head with a wrench. Wow. That would hurt really so, bad. So let's just cover this. Victoria has drowned a woman. Mm-hmm. Has thrown another, her best friend's son, into a manure pond. Mm-hmm. And now hits poor Jonah with a wrench. Jonah, who was her friend. Yeah. And then she tr- looked up to Tries to kid. burn his house down. Yeah. Because he knows about the Valerian. Right. They say that it's called Devil's Herb, and that and Hannah lets them know that there was a witch in 16, 1652 who was, she was accused of being a witch because she was making potions or whatever, and that was one of Jonah's family, one of its ancestors. I looked into Valerian to see if there was anything interesting about it, and they mostly cover what's interesting about yeah. it, except two little things. Okay. One, it's a cat attractant. Oh, not a Jack Russell attractant? Like catnip. Okay. Cats, cats like it. Okay. But I didn't know that the technical term for that was catattractant. Catattractant. And it's one of only a few flowers that are handed, which means that they're asymmetrical. Like there oh. are left-handed flowers and right-handed flowers. Okay. They don't follow, they're not symmetrical and they don't follow the, Sibina- the Fibonacci spiral. Oh, okay. Which there, there are just not many plants that do that. Yeah. So that's interesting about yeah. Valerian. But its its ability to put you to sleep and all that stuff is not really clinically proven. Mm. At the scene of the crime, they realize that Bloxham's alive, but he's touch and go, so he can't go. Uh, it was Victoria. Yeah, <laughs> but and we think his dog that, that the dog's going to be okay. Barnaby finds all the pictures and uh, actually the burnt pictures and the spots for the pictures. And I got to say, the set dressing here does a good job at. Being not only the shrine, but the remnants of the shrine afterwards. Yeah, they do a good job fading the wallpaper and yep. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Hannah goes to see her friend, uh, and then she has a gun. Yeah. It she takes her escalates shotgun. really quickly there. She's just had it. Because Hannah's figured everything out. Because Sam says that the um, that James's dog was poisoned with valerian. Yeah. And that just clicks everything in Hannah's yeah. mind. Now she knows who did it. Yeah. Because apparently Victoria was a bad kid. Yeah. Like serial killer kid. Yeah. Well. He used to poison. Well, yeah, that's true. She killed three people. She, she is kind of is kind a serial, of serial killer. killer here. She falls right into that stereotype of, you know, your kid might be a serial killer if they're killing animals as a child. Yeah. Like, and not killing. They were torturing animals. They were drugging them to see how much valerian they could give them before they would die. Yeah. Not good. Julie sees all this, of course, because she's detecting. <laughs> she's sitting in her window being nosy. And she's like, okay, mom, you're not going to believe me, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's the little girl who cried shotgun. They follow Victoria. Tom and Troy follow Victoria and Hannah out into the woods to the cottage where they used to play as kids. Yeah. And I remember, and it still shocked me, even as I rewatched it. I remember the first time I watched it, though, I was absolutely shocked that Hannah shoots Victoria. Like, with no, like, basically. They think that they've kind of lowered the tension in the situation. And she just shoots her. And then it's clear that Victoria thinks she's going to get away with it. Oh, take me home. Oh. And she's like, no, you're not, I'm not having that. You're not getting away with this. Yeah. I don't think she's my friend anymore. Bang. Yeah. I wouldn't let a dog of mine suffer like that. And then she's all happy. Well, she's resigned herself to what, what all that means. Yeah. And they take Hannah off to jail as they explain everything. Would Victoria's injury be worse than it is if she was shot with a shotgun that close? Like, 
It, okay, it depends if it's what kind of shotgun it is. If it's if it's um, shot or, or a cartridge. Yeah. Okay. Because the the sh- the wound looks to be about maybe the size of a hand. Yeah. And that's pretty big. I think if it was shot, the farther you weigh uh, away you are from the gun, the more spread out it would be. Yes. Right. So yeah. the fact that they're close together. So if it is buckshot, and she was using that same gun to kill pheasants earlier. Yeah, so, it's so it has buckshot. to be buckshot. Yeah, so that's probably right, you think? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be shot in the chest that close with a shotgun. I think it's probably going to deal you. Plus, I, I think... I wouldn't want to be shot with a shotgun at any distance. Well, you know, farm kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it also probably hit her neck and stuff like that. There would be a lot more blood than there was. Yeah, yeah. Because she'd have 50 little wounds. Yeah. So. so we've got three corpses. Yep. Susan Bartlett floating in the pond. Yep. James Harrington floating in a different kind of pond. And Victoria Bartlett. Who we barely range. see. We barely see Victoria. Yeah. So who's who's your favorite corpse? I got to say James because he's covered in all that stuff. He, he's a trooper as an actor. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he has to ride on a forklift. He's covered in crap, literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's talk after the credits. Wow, we got an interesting list here. Hannah's going to jail. Yep. We don't know if Jonah's going to live. Hannah's going to jail. I think she, Hannah's going to do fine in jail. I think so, too. She'll be like a matron in jail. I think she's resigned herself to it. Yep. Simon sells the farm because he says he's going to sell the farm. And now that his mother's a homicidal maniac, Simon's going to sell the farm. His mom's dead. Yeah. So he probably really wants to get away from there. Yep. All the more reason to get out of it. James's wife gets the farm, gets the farm, the insurance money, and the deal with the forestry guys. Yeah. She cleans up. Caroline is going to be okay. Bernadette keeps practicing law. I don't think Simon's going to have anything to do with her anymore. No, me either. I think she'll find somebody else to grab onto. Julie joins the police force. <laughs> you think we're going to see her as WPC later? Maybe. <laughs> And then her little brother's still playing Aladdin. Yeah. <laughs> with his NFL sheets. Sean moves to America. Yeah. <laughs> I think he wants to. He clearly likes American culture, right? Absolutely. Oh, it's quite the episode. Just to recap, this episode's going to release on the 16th of December. So you, you're listening to it either on the 16th or soon after. And we will have a mini episode coming out the week before. And then this week also, so the week of the 16th. We're not going to take a week off from the many non-spoiler episodes. But we are taking a week off from the main episode. So where you would normally get an episode on the 23rd of December, we're going to take a week off. And as you should, too, you should spend some time with your families. (laughs) Instead of listening to Maniacs. But we'll have a mini episode (laughs) that week. Yes. (laughs) And then we will return uh, with episode... Uh, it would be 22, yeah. Uh, which will be on the 30th, and that's the Bell Ringer episode. Hoo-ha! That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Jerry! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you haven't been listening to the mini episodes, they're for season 21, the brand new episode. They're we, spoiler free. We promise you they give nothing away. Um, but we think you'll have a lot of fun if you listen to them before you watch because we're going to teach you how to watch Midsummer Like a Maniac. Um, so maybe that's something you should do in that week when we're not going to release another episode. If you haven't watched the new episodes yet and you haven't listened to those mini episodes, that'd be a good time I, to do I'm it. still pretty stunned that we've only watched half of them. I know. We've been very good. We're, well, we've been really busy. Yeah, we, it's insane that's in December kept, That's kept us. us from uh, sitting down and just gorging on all of them. Yes. Right? So we are at Midsummer Maniacs on Instagram and Twitter, and we're midsummermaniacs at gmail.com is our email address, and we're on the Acorn Facebook group and the Midsummer Murders Facebook group, and also the Reddit subreddit yeah. <laughs> for Midsummer Murders. The subreddit for Midsummer. Yeah. So since we won't have another episode next week, we're taking the week off, yes. we hope that you and your families have a wonderful holiday and that you get a little time to take a break and get cozy on the couch and watch some murder. Yep, and we've absolutely gotten... So much awesome response. We just want to say thank you again for listening to our crazy little idea that we had way back in August that maybe we should have a podcast. What would we have a podcast about? Midsummer Murders. Wait, let's make a Midsummer Murder podcast. 
like 20 people would listen to it. No. Yeah, no, like thousands of people listen to this <laughs> podcast. And that's insane that so many of you listen to this podcast. We super appreciate it and hope you all have a great holiday. Uh, happy holidays. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. So mm-hmm. with the the uh um plow sorry i have such problems remembering that word plow <laughs>